My message this morning is called A Glimmer of Hope in a Violent World. Now there's lots in that Luke passage that a preacher could pull out and many lift up the incident of healing, but that's not where I'm going this morning. Well, let us pray. Spirit of God, be with us. Touch us like those flames of Pentecost touch your disciples. Warm our hearts, clear our minds, that we may hear you amongst us this day. Amen. On Monday, a car bomb killed six people, including four police officers and a child outside a police station in Turkey. This week, a series of explosions rocked three popular tourist venues in Thailand, killing four people and wounding a dozen others. Last Sunday, a man attacked passengers on a Swiss train with a knife and a burning liquid of some kind. Besides the injured, a 34-year-old woman died of her wounds. Last weekend, a 20-year-old was stabbed and seriously hurt in the Riverdale area of Toronto. On Monday, a Saskatchewan farmer opened fire on a carload of young Indigenous men, killing 22-year-old Colton Bushy. The men were looking for help with a flat tire. If we really pay attention to the news most of the time, we could become totally overwhelmed with what's happening in the world, especially when there's no good news to mediate the rest of it. Now, we've been blessed in the last two weeks to have Olympic coverage, which has highlighted not only international competition, but cooperation and compassion. But it will soon be back to the media looking for bad news stories. Now, Jesus didn't have to go looking for that kind of conflict. It followed him around, it seems. In a passage that starts out with such good news, the healing of a woman who'd bent over with arthritis for 18 years and whom, on whom Jesus laid his hand and said, woman, you are free, and suddenly she was straight and tall. But then the scribes and the Pharisees start nitpicking. Who is he to be healing? And on the Sabbath and in the synagogue, well, what is this really about? These stories of conflict with religious leaders are usually read by Christians to show that the synagogue leaders were rigid, legalistic, and heartless, as opposed to Jesus, who was flexible and compassionate. And in fact, Luke wrote it that way. But reading that way ignores a lot of context that is important and has historically led to anti-Semitism. The major thing to know is that Jesus and the synagogue leaders in this story are engaging in a common practice, a form of Jewish disputation. They are arguing over the correct interpretation and enactment of the law. Neither of them is asking that the law be revoked or changed. They are merely arguing over its interpretation. And it's easy to see this story as a high stakes drama over the meaning of an entire religious tradition. But Jews did it all the time, they still do. This is a very, very rich tradition of argument and disputation in Judaism. And this fits very well 
into the tradition. In fact, it's been said that the Jewish national sport is arguing. It is this arguing or lively discussion that has led to an incredible library of Midrash dating from the second century to present day. Now, Midrash, roughly explained, is a written record of the process of interpretation of the Hebrew scriptures. And it changes based on the context of that discussion, such as arguing about healing on a Sabbath. Jesus would have thought of this as one Jew debating another Jew about the limit of Sabbath restrictions. Christians misread it when they make it more than that. <clears throat> it's pretty amazing how much that exorcism or healing aspect of this story is downplayed. The story, the scripture becomes about work on the Sabbath. But the way it is told, the woman's complaint is because of a spirit. Jesus heals her, presumably, by neutralizing that spirit. It seems like another line of argumentation available to Jesus would have been that the exorcism doesn't count as work. Instead, he argues that healing her was analogous to untying a donkey. So what's really at stake in the conflict between these religious leaders and Jesus? Why does Luke tell and emphasize these stories? I believe this is where we find the glimmer of hope I mentioned in my title. And the willingness of Jesus to engage in discussion and arguing with the leaders of the synagogue. Yes, even the priests. He didn't just walk away and ignore them because he didn't want to argue. He didn't stoop to violence simply because they didn't agree. He didn't pull out a gun to stop the argument so he could have the last word. Instead, Jesus engaged in the discussion and made the point there was a precedent for his work on the Sabbath. Jesus and the church officials were different. They interpreted scripture differently. They lived a different lifestyle and associated with different people. But they were willing to engage each other. As we hear in the media, story after story of violence in our world, I wonder if arguing, debating, discussing might be a better way to go but only if we truly listen. And I think that works in almost any context, whether small group or congregational work or the wider community. Because it is okay to have a different opinion than someone else. Disagreeing doesn't mean we have to fight about it. For God loves diversity. God has created us all to be unique, and this is something to celebrate. In Genesis 10, which is basically a who's who of the roots of the Israelite people, we learn how different ethnic identities form part of God's purposes. And in chapter 11, which is the story of the Tower of Babel, we discover what happens when people seek 
cultural uniformity and their attempt to dominate other people groups. Throughout history, ethnic identity has often brought conflict and tension. And it certainly is in the Middle East today. This is not the way it should be. The Bible tells us that human beings were created to live in a harmonious relationship with God and with one another. The root of the conflict is a broken relationship with God. After the shooting in Saskatchewan this week, and a rash of racist comments on social media, Premier Wall, Brad Wall stated, I call on the Saskatchewan people to rise above the intolerance, to be our best and be the kind of neighbors and fellow citizens we are reputed to be. A call to be in relationship with one another. For Jesus calls us to love our neighbor as ourselves and to love God, to be in relationship with God and with each other. That means family, friends, strangers, even enemies. July 7th, 2016, there was a shooting in Dallas at a Black Lives Matter demonstration where one lone gunman targeted and killed five Dallas policemen. An officer who isn't identified told people at the memorial service for Sergeant Michael Smith, who was one of those officers killed, how the police and community re relationship has been damaged by both sides. He says, unfortunately, this relationship has been hurt by the misdeeds of the few, whether it be law enforcement or from the civilians who wish to do others harm. In order to forge a continued relationship, forgiveness of the hurt must come first. The officer went on to say, Love is the answer. It sounds great, but how do we accomplish that when there's been so much tension, hatred, fear, and confusion? Forgiveness must come first for love to be established. The same forgiveness that Christ Jesus offers us. Communication and change of action much must follow to reestablish that trust. It's here, then, where he gets at the heart of the matter. To those protesters, he said, who cried out Thursday night to my team as we rushed to El Centro to help out, how does it feel to be the one hunted? I say to you, I'm sorry. I am so sorry <clears throat> that you felt as if your voice, your opinion, and your life did not matter to us. I am sorry for the misdeeds and wrongs of the few in my profession over the years that have caused and created this distrust, fear, and anger towards law enforcement. And he ends saying, we want a relationship with the community. Because we cannot carry this fight by ourselves. We cannot fight the criminals and the people we were sworn to protect. You do matter. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, hatred paralyzes life, love releases it. Hatred confuses life, love harmonizes it. Hatred darkens life, love illuminates it. As Christians, we are called to sing at the top of our lungs a song of love with heart and soul and voice. 
in the sanctuary, in the streets, and among the masses of humanity who suffer so much at the hands of others. That is our glimmer of hope. Our song of faith, which is our current statement of faith, the United Church of Canada, says, made in the image of God, we yearn for the fulfillment that is life in God. Yet we choose to turn away from God. We surrender ourselves to sin, a disposition revealed in selfishness, cowardice, or apathy, becoming bound and complacent in a web of false desires and wrong choices. We bring harm to ourselves and others. This brokenness in human life and community is an outcome of sin. Sin is not only personal, but accumulates to become habitual and systemic forms of injustice, violence, and hatred. With empires and systems of domination. And so we sing of lament and repentance. Yet evil does not, cannot undermine the love of God. God forgives and calls us to confess our fears and failings with honesty and humility. God reconciles and calls us to repent the part we have played in damaging our world, ourselves, and each other. God transforms and calls us to protect the vulnerable, to pray for deliverance from evil, to work with God in the healing of our world that all might have abundant life. And so we sing. How long will we sing? How long will we pray? How long will we write and send? How long will we stay? How long will we make amends? Until we are fed body and soul, until all on earth have the bread of life, like the one who loves each and every one, we serve until all are fed. Amen.